Rub up your engines! Today I'm going to show you what happens to a vehicle when you hit a curb while you're driving. Now the superficial damage, the plastic rubber bumper being pushed in, that's just the tip of the iceberg. It might look bad, but it's what's underneath that's the bad stuff. So I get our big old mat and a jack and a jack stand. We'll go under the hood, find a good solid metal part to jack it up on. Like right here. That frame's nice and solid there. So a wheel and the jack and start jacking it up. Up it goes. Now we got the jack stand. The first thing we're going to check for are any obviously broken parts. Grab it here and here at 3 and 9 o'clock and there's no real play. Then we'll grab it at 12 o'clock and 9 o'clock and there's no real play. So there's nothing actually broken but there could be a lot of stuff bent. I'll take off the wheel and off it comes. Look around here. The bolts aren't broken. There's nothing broken huh? But this is what often happens with these. When you hit a curb, you hit the bottom of the tire. And that often bends the lower control arm here. So we'll look closely at the shape of the lower control arm. And I can see some stress marks on it. And look at the other side. So we have to compare these sides very closely. Look at them really close. This is the undamaged driver's side. And as we swing over, this is the damaged passenger side. And I can see that these angles are slightly different. So we're gonna really have to change the lower control arm and the ball joint on the bottom here. They've gotten bent. And now comes the real fun. Here's the control arm. It is a rather large piece and it requires quite a bit of work to get off. Here it is. What happens is when it gets hit, this stuff just bends. It's steel, but you hit it hard enough, it'll bend. And here's a big trick to make it easier. You don't want any strain on the front suspension, so we got the jack stand on this side, so we'll lower the jack. Then we'll jack up the other side, then the suspension drops and we won't get too much strain for working. We'll jack this side up so the wheel's off the ground, and once it's off the ground, then the suspension isn't loaded and it's going to be easier to do the job. Now you have to unbolt a lot of stuff. First we unbolt the big one here. There's a nut and a bolt that comes off, and they come off. Then we'll remove the torsion bar bolt here because it'll put too much strain otherwise. Off it comes then, that pushes out of the way, but then comes a stinker. The bolts that hold the front on, there's one here, but one of them is hidden behind the motor mount, so we got to get the stupid motor mount out of the way. They didn't think about this when they designed it. To get a long bar and a socket and, uh, to get these off. It's always fun getting these things off. So you got to unbolt this motor mount, get that out of the way. There goes one part, there goes the other. And now we can reach the stupid bolt that holds it on here that you couldn't reach otherwise. What a stupid design. Now you gotta unbolt that and do the other side over here too. Now with the little prime, uh, the whole thing falls off. There it is. Then you slide the A-frame in. You gotta line it up here. That's the hard part. You get it close and you tap it until you can get this bolt in. Then you bolt everything on real tight. You don't want this thing coming off. Then you slide the motor mount in and the bracket and put all the bolts back in because the stupid thing was in the way to get that A-frame bolt off. At least it's almost over now. Get that motor mount nice and tight. Then we go to the bottom here. Pull the ball joints bolt on and bolt those back up. Get them nice and tight. Get them on nice and tight. You don't want these suckers coming loose. They put the strut mount on for the torsion bar. Then put the tire back on. Let the car down slowly. So you don't break anything. And take it for a drive. And voila, now our corner's fine. No more clunking. And look at the steering wheel. Not only is it not shaking, but it's pointed straight. It was crooked before from the bends. So the next time your car hits a curb, You'll know what to do. It's off in a bent lower control arm. And here's some bonus questions and answers. Gabriel CG Podcast says, Scotty, I have the 08 Lexus ES350 with 105,000 miles. I don't owe anything for it. It's paid off. But I replaced two water pumps, a radiator, my AC went out in the last two years. Should I sell it and get a better car? One, those are great cars. I wouldn't sell it. I'd sell that mechanic and go someplace else. Seems to me the guy's ripping you off. I have never seen one that had to have two water pumps replaced and a radiator at 105,000 miles. I mean, 
I've never seen that. I'm assuming he's either ripping you off or he's buying really crap parts because those Lexus water pumps, I've seen them go three, four hundred thousand miles. And so you've replaced two of them. So that means you've gone through three of them in a hundred thousand miles. That tells me the guy's either not doing the work or he's charging for stuff he isn't doing or he's using really crappy parts. I've seen people get ripped off on that. I would just forget that guy and go someplace else. I have never ever seen a Lexus go through three water pumps. I haven't even seen them go through one in that kind of mileage. One water pump, okay, maybe there was a design flaw, but another one, ah, uh, I'd be real leery about the guy. I would go to somebody else. Ask your friends what independent mechanics they use and use them. Because those V6 engines, those things are ultra dependable and it sounds very fishy to me. George, the new mechanic says, Scott, if your car's oil is 530, can you use a lighter like the 020? Will it damage the car? Yes, never go lighter. Oils are light enough as it is. When you go lighter, it's going to be too light. The engine's going to wear out faster. That's just the way that it goes. Let's say you live in a really cold place like Alaska or North Dakota or something in the winter. You can go to full synthetic. The advantage of full synthetic oils are is they flow better in colder weather. That's one of the reasons they came up with those. The military needed it for stuff in Alaska and different things. It flows really good when it's really cold. So use 5W30 full synthetic oil. Don't go lighter. Going lighter is a mistake. The only reason they use lightweight oils like in race cars so they can go faster. Hilariously enough, during the practice laps, when they're practicing, they use a heavier oil and they have the older engines in them to practice with. But during the race, they put in the newest engine and they put in the lightest oil so they can go the fastest. But they'll also wear out the fastest. Not. But then again, you know, a race car goes in a 500 mile race. After 500 miles, they put another engine in. You want to change your engine every 500 miles? Not a smart move, yeah? <laughs> Mike Sturm says, Scott, I got a question. I got a friend that smells gas in the back of a 2001 Toyota standing in the back of the car. There's basically three things that could do it. One, have them check the gas cap. If it's loose or missing, yeah, you're going to smell it at the back. Since you don't have a tester for it, you might just go to a place like AutoZone or something, buy a gas cap, put a new gas cap on. It's often just that. You shut the car off and you smell the fumes. It could be the EVAP canister vent valve is going bad. That vents the fumes. If it goes bad and stays open when it's supposed to be closed, you smell fumes. Now the other one, the third thing is, it's only going to happen when a car is running. If it only happens when it's running and you smell it, go to the tailpipe and smell it. And if you smell it there, that means the engine's running too rich and it's coming out of the tailpipe because it's not burning right. It could need a tune-up, might have dirty fuel injectors, but pinpoint where the smell's coming from first. And if it only happens when the car is running, then you know it has to do with the tailpipe's emission and then you figure out why the car isn't running right. A lot of reasons in a 19 year old car, but if it only does it when you have the car turned off, then yeah, try a gas cap and see if the vent valve's leaking. Frankie says, hey Scotty, what's your opinion on a 2010 Chevy Camaro LT for $6,900 with only 80,000 miles? I'm not a GM fan. If you don't mind horrible gas mileage, they can be a fun car. And $6,900 is a lot less money than the car went for originally, but this is a gigantic but that's a Camaro. Guys buy those things. They generally rag the heck out of them. And the engines and the transmissions are gone. They're just a worn out husk by the time you're going to buy one when it's 10 years old, even with 80,000 miles on it. If you are serious, you don't mind horrible gas mileage, take that car to a mechanic like me, have him go through it with a fine tooth comb to check it out. And he'll tell you, well, this is worn, this isn't worn. You can't hide stuff from a good mechanic on any modern car because our fancy scan tools, hey, they have all that data. And it doesn't matter if the guy disconnected warning lights or stuff, that data is still in a computer. And when we take it for a road test and analyze pages of data, looking at it to see if it's all normal, find out if there's something wrong with it or not. You can't hide from those things. Sparkling Claw says, why do sports cars break down all the time, especially the English one? Well, there's not too many English sports cars left. The MG, the Chinese own them. They don't even make the sports cars anymore. They only make uh, SUVs now, MG brand in China. Uh, that was always the thing with sports cars. You know, oh, well, they're fast and they're cutting edge, but they break down. A lot of it is an image thing that the sports car had the luxury engines and stuff, and so they put high-tech stuff that was new and new stuff often breaks. But I do have to say, out of all the companies in the world, back then it wasn't even called Nissan, it was called Datsun. Datsun came out with that little bitty six-cylinder inline 240. Those things, they revolutionized sports cars because they were cute little sports cars that didn't break down, that got good gas mileage and were really fast. So they don't all break down all the time. The Lexus sports cars don't break down. The Honda 
of the sports cars don't break down all the time. But a lot of sports cars, Jaguars, you know, BMW, yes, they break down a lot because they're they more followed the luxury car idea that, hey, they're going to pay a bunch of money for this and it's got cutting edge technology. These people have money. Yeah, let's make them so they break. Then we can make money fixing them. Or then they'll buy another sports car because we want to keep selling new ones. Look, we changed the design this year. You got to go out and buy one. <laughs> and of course, the other reason that sports cars break down is the people that buy them drive like lunatics. <laughs> Take a Ford Mustang. They're pretty well-made V8 engines. But if you drive like a maniac and revel in it all the time, anything is going to break down if you abuse it. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.